I have very iffy um, connection here at the church, so I may be in and out. <clears throat> are we on? Oh, there we are. Hey, we're live. All right. Hey, hello, everyone. We have a really exciting show today with a lot of guests. And uh, before we get to all of our special guests, we always do a UU roundup. So we'll do that first. This is Meg Riley. I'm here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It is a perfect day. It's going to be like 70 and I'm leaving for two months Saturday and my peonies are blooming and I'm so happy I get to see them before I go because I love all the flowers, but they're my secret favorite. Aisha, how are you out on the West Coast? Uh, I'm Aisha Hauser and I'm in Seattle. And uh, so it was in the 90s yesterday and people in Seattle were melting because we overreact to any weather that really the rest of the country feels all the time. So if we get two inches of snow, <laughs> We run out of avocados. If we hit 90, people think <laughs> everything is dying and we're all done. So that's me in Seattle. Uh, Christina Rivera, how are you? Hey, Aisha. Hi, everyone. Christina Rivera. I'm coming to you from sunny Charlottesville, Virginia. Great weather. Looking forward to being on the West Coast into uh, Asia, Seattle, and then Spokane. Here we come. And the view will be coming to Spokane. I'm sure we'll say more about that later. Michael Tino, how are you doing, Lee? Uh, I'm doing just fine this morning. Thank you, Chris. This is Michael Tino in Peekskill, New York, where uh, we've got Seattle's weather. It is a beautiful, rainy, cool day uh, to start the summer. And um, I, I am, among other things, preparing not for GA, um, but for the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and my child's sixth birthday, which it does not seem possible that it is, but uh, she was born during GA in Louisville six years ago, and it's happening. So here we go. Margalie Billy's there behind the tech deck. How are you? Hello, doing excellently. I am coming to you from a wet, rainy Cromwell, Connecticut, um, but I love the rain in cloudy days. So I'm not complaining, just uh, stating a fact. So I will be, for those of you um, watching and following us, I'll be looking for your comments and questions so that everyone here is aware of what you're thinking and what you're asking so they can respond to your um, questions. So thank you for joining us and back to Meg. So we, we always talk a little bit about what's going on in Unitarian Universalism. And we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the guidelines and what's up with some people who don't like, you know, anyway, some complexity. But I want to say before we do that I got um, emails from a couple people who are not ministers saying, I have no idea what you are talking about. I don't know the old guidelines. I don't know the new. So you know what? It might be a time to make a cup of tea. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to say this is going to be insider baseball talk for a few minutes, but then we'll get to a really great show that you'll love. Um, so just to say that. So Michael, why don't you start us? Because admittedly, I'm packing for Alaska. I am so out of every loop that exists. So how about you start filling us in? I, I would be glad to, and I'm not packing for anything. And um, I, uh, so those of you who are regular view members or viewers uh, know uh, that we had on, oh goodness, probably four or five weeks ago now, the committees that were responsible for uh, proposing new ethical standards and professional guidelines for Unitarian Universalist ministers. Um, and these, these are things that the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association is being asked to pass um, and would go in, it takes a two year vote, I guess. So they would go into effect after next General Assembly. Um, and in a nutshell, they, they revamp the way we do accountability uh, with regard to um, ethical violations and ministerial misconduct, and also um, anti-oppression and anti-racism work. Um, they really take um, take a new approach to how we hold ourselves as ministers accountable to the standards that we have, and it's new, and it's it's very very different, and it's proposing a very different system. And uh, change brings anxiety, and change when it uh, involves anti-oppression, um, brings anxiety that is sometimes rooted in uh, fragility and white supremacy. Um, 
And uh, so, so there is a, a counter proposal that the, the, the gist of which is let's take a year to study it, but which actually has numerous critiques of the guidelines proposal in it. Um, and I'm really trying to, to be measured in my in my hold on because I'm gonna I'm gonna be the stooge here. Weren't we already gonna take a year to study it? I mean, nothing was gonna be passed at this general assembly. The amendment is right? to put off for another year. You, so you it, have to, two you have year to study vote. Now. the vote will be whether or not to study it. So there will be a vote by UUMA members as to whether or not to go into basically a year of discernment around these proposed new guidelines. So all you UMA members, y'all have a pretty important vote coming up here. So my well, and, and study would also mean trying them out potentially, right? So as a good officer, I was working with someone recently and one of the ideas was, could we propose that this person that they could be a, a study example for this, right? N anticipating if this passed, could they enter in and be an example of someone who agrees as their process of working through a violation of ethics to, to see how this process worked? Because studying it intellectually might not actually give us all the data we need. Yeah, I think that's right. And so, so the, the initial piece is, oh, let's put that part off for a year. But the critique is really what I, um, want to just spend a minute engaging with because one of the things that that this group of folks who's written this critique says is that um holding ministers to a standard of ethical behavior with regard to other staff people in our congregations um is somehow a violation of our congregational polity um that it is really up to congregations and congregational leadership to hold ministers accountable for their ethical behavior with regard to other staff people. And um, I am really rather offended by that. I think it's rooted in a misunderstanding of congregational polity and a fundamental ignorance about how congregations are willing and able to uh, actually hold ministers accountable for behaviors like that. And I could get into examples of what I have seen my colleagues do to their staff colleagues that, that congregations have sometimes even been openly complicit in. For example, uh, derailing religious educators from the credentialing process, um, that, that congregations have openly been complicit in derailing their religious educators from the credentialing process because they don't wanna have to give them a raise when, when they finish it, right? And so I view that as unethical behavior uh, and um, congregations don't, right? So I think the, the Unitarian Universalist ministers should be setting sort of minimum ethical standards for one another. Uh, and if congregations wanna have additional standards that they hold their ministers to, that's fine. But it's like, you know, we set minimum standards in the country for car emissions and California goes beyond that, but Nebraska can't be below it. Right, and I think that too many of our congregations are Nebraska and not enough of them are California. So I see a comment from Christiana Willie McKnight who's on the UMA board saying, structurally as I understand it, the amendment wants to dictate how the study is done rather than allowing the guidelines committee to create the study process and working with the many, many people we as the guidelines committee interviewed. And, and that's troubling to me. I mean, like I said, I've really been on the sidelines of this, but I do know from the folks that we had on how thoroughly and how much time they put in. And to me, this feels like undermining their leadership. And, um, and that disturbs me because whatever the study would conclude, it seems like trusting the leadership of the people we empower to lead is part of what we as ministers are always complaining other people don't do for us. And so that, that really troubles me, even aside from the content, which um, I, I'm literally just starting to wade into. And, and it's long and complicated and, and the guidelines. I mean, so there's, to me, having two years to talk about it, figure it out, as Vanessa said, try it on, makes all the sense in the world. But short-circuiting the leadership that we empowered, I, that just makes me really sad. And it does feel like it's rooted in anxiety and distrust. And, and I also, that makes me also very sad. 
and from other ministers, which is exactly to me indicates the reason why this needs to happen. And, and when I saw the letter, what I thought was, it kind of reminded me of when, when white people said, uh, who, who reacted badly to or strongly to the words white supremacy. Well, look, you could talk about anti-oppression, anti-racism, but you have to do it in a way that I can handle. Um, so we're going to control it, how you can talk about oppression and racism. And so it just struck me that way. And I, Meg, I exactly thought the same thing. I said, wow, if you all are doing this to each other and you don't trust the people who spent a significant amount of time doing this and you're all ministers, then how are you treating congregations? How are you, this, this speaks to kind of how power is used and it, it's, it's not a, frankly, it's not a good look. I'm not, I'm not clear on why you wouldn't want to engage in a thoughtful way and talk to your colleagues. You're all gonna, many of you are going to be together next week. You could talk in your chapters. Um, and I agree with you, Meg, to, to seemingly derail it in this way is um, you're all our spiritual leaders and people who aren't in the UUMA are watching. And it's, um, and thank you, Vanessa, because that when you said that there was someone willing to try it out, I'm like, yes, be open hearted, be curious. And, and you could say, oh, well, here's what didn't work. Here's what worked, but come in with curiosity. You're all charged with being our spiritual leaders and, and it's disappointing at best. I mean, I don't think we have to be surprised that there's critique, right? Uh, like that is who we are and that's our strength and it's our weakness, right? That we always come in with a strong suspicion of authority and a critique and it will forever be our incredible strength in the world and our Achilles heel and we will always have to ride that place. Um, so I think I can, you know, I can be as open to the critique and looking for the wisdom that's in some of the pieces of the critique, even naming the pieces, as you're saying, Aisha, that don't feel like they're constructive in ways that we might agree we want to kind of check and invite people to, you know, to hold a little more lightly. Um, but I'm not surprised that there's critique and I wouldn't want there to be none, right? I, because it's important. I do love the idea that we would move increasingly from a punitive notion of, of how we deal with our colleagues to a restorative notion, right? Like we are such a small faith family that we cannot cast people out too fast, right? We have to be doing the work of like growing and loving each other into better ways. And yes, there are times to draw hard boundaries and ask someone to step outside them for at least a while. Um, but hopefully we find ways to do more restorative justice as our central practice, more mercy, you know, along with justice. And, and that was really, you know, at the ethics panel that was convened between the religious um, professional organizations, that was um, a key highlight that we really tried to keep coming back to is um, so much of this is couched in, in the punitive and the, and, you know, what are we going to do when people, you know, step out of those boundaries and, and do act um, in unethical ways. Um, and really trying to remain grounded in our Unitarian Universalist faith and theology um, in how we go through those processes. And, and so that's, to me, one of the reasons why I was, I, I'm all for critique and, and being in conversation around, you know, what that critique is, which would, to me, say, yeah, you know, of course we want to vote to study this for a year so that we have that time to have that critique and have that time to examine those guidelines as presented um, in a way that honors the work that has been done, um, but also honors that, you know, there's some other folks out there that might have some great ideas. Um, I think what I found really disturbing uh, about the response was um, kind of the premise that 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 everything everything could be fine if we just you know had a little bit more training, had a little bit more faith in in um, one another to or, to already hold each other accountable. Like things were okay if we just do a little bit more. And which really was like, no, things are not okay. Like religious educators, you know, administrators, directors of music, membership professionals have been saying for years that things are not okay with our collegial um, covenant between each other. And 
it, it really, it felt very gaslighting to me um, when reading this as though, you know, we, if we just put a little bit more effort into it, everything's going to be fine and we, and we can hold each other accountable and, and it's all going to work out well. As though that hadn't been tried. I mean, there's, there's folks who, um, who have honestly, you know, experienced real harm in these relationships and there has been no way of addressing that um, up until now uh, with, the, with this proposal. So that was the part that for me was, was really kind of uh, tough, to, tough to read. Um, and, and in particular with, you know, um, the folks that are signed on to this, you know, I'm gonna be real honest, there's, there's folks on there that I was really surprised uh, to see signed on to this and, and really um, taken aback um, to, to know um, that that's kind of where our collegiality stood. And, um, and I'm making, you know, efforts to reach out to those folks because um, I think that's what we have to do, right? <laughs> if we're colleagues is uh, reach out and say, hey, wow, that thing that you said, I'm, I really need to know where you're coming from on that because that is not my understanding of um, how we need to be together in our ministry. Thank you. And of course, we could do the whole show on this, but we actually have guests to talk about something else that's really um, exciting. And uh, that's what they came for. So we're going to move to that. I, I can confidently say this is not the last conversation that we will have about this. So Colin Bosson, Vanessa Southern, Kim Hampton, and Danielle DeBona are all here. And Aisha Hauser, I'm going to turn it over to you. So uh, I'm going to, Reverend Vanessa Southern is the developmental minister serving the first UU Society of San Francisco and was also the host of the second men's lecture. There's a series. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Colin Bosson serves as the interim minister of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston, Texas, where I preached in May. That was fun. And as an African American Religious Studies Forum affiliate with Rice's Uni Rice University's Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning. Uh, and your PhD is in American Studies from Harvard University. And the Reverend Danielle DeBona. Hi, Rat Danielle. And Kim Hampton, graduate of Earl Earlham Relig School of Religion. And I just scrolled and lost it. Uh, is a graduate of Earlham School of Religion and is a church and nonprofit consultant based in St. Louis and Boston, currently working on co-editing a book on theology and Black Panther. And you're soon to be an adjunct professor at Star King for the School, school of Ministry. Woo. So I'm gonna start with you, Reverend Dr. Colin. I, I like Colin. You introduced that. Danielle. Uh, Danielle wrote Reverend Danielle DeBona. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's who she is. She always is. And I know, Danielle, you serve as the chaplain to our UUA Board of Trustees, right? Yes. Um, so, Colin, can you yeah, first? And, yeah. Oh, and, and Danielle is the, uh, I, I forget whether it's developmental assistant or associate minister or with First Parish Cambridge. Yes. And the most recent recipient of the Distinguished Service Award issued by the Unitarian Universalist Association. Yes, and one of the respondents, actually the only respondent on the panel um, right now that we have today. So Colin, can you start with um, what is the men's lecture briefly and then what your idea was that you brought to the committee that was accepted um, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so the men's lecture is a annual lecture series put on by a collaboration between First Church Boston and King's Chapel that's been going on since I think 1940, but uh, I could be slightly off there somehow. Um, that uh, is supposed to be, uh, I forget the, what the actual language is, but it's basically like of topics of theological uh, interest to Unitarian Universalists. Um, so it's a significant lecture series, sort of like um, the Berry Street lecture or uh, some of the Ware lecture, I mean, that is done uh, every year. Um, James Luther Adams, George Hunston Williams, uh, Mark Morrison Reed, Rosemary Bray McNatt have all done men's lectures at some point. Um, so I was invited by the committee to give uh, 
demo proposal. So the way it works is uh, the committee accepts proposals. Um, sometimes they reach out to people, like sometimes people submit stuff and uh, you say they wanted something based that touched on my dissertation research, which is on the religious dimensions of American populism. So I said, okay, why don't I do something that is related to Unitarian Universalism and American populism? And so they accepted and um, I am doing, well, the third lecture will be at GA at 1.30 on Thursday. Um, Susan Frederick Gray will be my respondent to that. And uh, so there's three, I have three lectures. The first one was in Boston at First Church. Um, and so the overall lecture series is on, is titled uh, Unitarian Universalism and American Populism. Um, and so the, uh, through the three lectures, I'm sort of tracing both the history of American populism and how Unitarians, and to a lesser extent, Universalists have um, responded to it or interacted with it. Um, and so I, this is, some of this is quite intellectual. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm sort of making an argument that uh, populism, progressivism, and what I'm calling prefiguration um, are three different political ontologies or modes of being or doing politics. What's the third um, thing you said? Populism, pre progressive. Prefiguration or prefigurative ontologies. It's a relatively technical academic term, but basically could be summarized um, from uh, the Christian Testament and the Gospel of Luke, Jesus's famous uh, sort of aphorism. Um, you know, look, uh, the kingdom of God is among you, right? The idea that um, it is in the present moment that we sort of constitute political reality or social relations rather than uh, at some future moment. So both progressivism and populism are future oriented ontologies. They are trying, trying to create a, a mode of being a, a political system or a political relation in, at some future point, whereas prefiguration or prefigurative uh, ontologies focus on the, the, the present. So you might think of Martin Buber's I and Thou or Levinas or something like that in relation to this, uh, that, that move as well. Um, so yeah, so the, the three lectures, uh, the first one looks at uh, sort of a major organizing moment in um, American populism around the sort of Jacksonian populists. And I chose that that moment because uh, a portion of the lecture is really trying to focus on the analytical project of dismantling white supremacy and the contemporary sort of white supremacist in chief, our uh, president, Donald Trump, um, and his surrounding body of people self-identify as Jacksonian populists. I mean, you can go and read Trump put uh, a picture of Andrew Jackson or portrait of Andrew Jackson in the Oval Office. They've stopped the process of putting Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill to replace Jackson. Um, they're very clear that this is sort of their major uh, historical figure. So I wanted to look back and say, what was Jacksonian populism? And like, how does it relate to white supremacy and white supremacist ideologies? And how did Unitarians uh, deal with it? Um, so that was the first lecture. The second lecture was looking at conflicts between progressives and populists in the early 20th century, centering on Ethelred Brown, who was uh, um, the minister of the Harlem Unitarian Church and his conflicts with uh, Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which was the largest, uh, or well, still is the largest mass movement in um, the history of the African diaspora and was uh, populist focused in that uh, Garvey was a charismatic leader who was trying to constitute uh, a notion of an African people that was global. Because populists organize around the idea that there's a distinct people that, um, that somehow should have political agency. And then uh, the second part of that lecture was looking at the conflicts between um, Francis Greenwood Peabody, who was a professor at Harvard and the founder of the sort of discipline of, of social ethics, which is a, a theological discipline. 
um, with uh, the radical labor union, the industrial workers of the world. Um, and then this last lecture is sort of bringing things up to the present, thinking about sort of contemporary moments of conflict between populist progressives and what is the sort of church or Unitarian Universalist institutions called to do in this, this moment uh, today and how do we respond to what I'm arguing is a, a threat of both totalitarianism on the one hand uh, and uh, enduring pervasive white supremacy and the climate catastrophe on the other. So um, that's a very short nutshell. <laughs> I feel like you just tried to do a three hour lecture, three, lecture. Uh, yeah. three hours of lecture in three minutes and I'm, I'm swimming. I'm back with, I didn't know that the White House loved Jackson so much and, and that's terrifying. I mean, Daniel yeah. Jabona, I bet you have really specific responses to that. I mean, Jackson, my God, he was, I mean, there's a lot of competition for the most racist president ever, but he's certainly with regard to Native Americans. I, I mean, so anyway, I'm like, I'm way back in lecture one. I, I don't know where everyone yeah. else went, but that, it seems like, and, and I'm just curious why Unitarian Universalists you feel like are related to that. Did, did they love Jackson too? I mean, I, I'm just, trying to catch up here. Well, I, I'd love to hear what Danielle has to say and then I can respond to that question. If she, are, are you still with us, Danielle? I'm, I'm with us. Okay. Um, well, again, thank you, Colin, for uh, asking me to be one of the responders to your first lecture. Um, I think one of the first things I said when I was responding was that it was very hard to listen and hear what you were saying about the time of Jackson and his plan to annihilate all Native people for a number of reasons, a lot, uh, a big reason being expansion and capitalism. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so, Again, I, I listened again this morning to your first lecture, Colin, and you know, again, it's heartbreaking um, for me to read that and infuriating. And one of the things I said when I responded was that in spite of Jackson's efforts to annihilate the native people, um, I'm a proud Wampanoag and guess what? I'm still here and so are my people. Um, so what concerns me is that we're, we're looking at a Jacksonian presidency right now. And although my people and native people don't seem to be the target yet, the, similar, the similarity be between Jacksonian um, annihilation of the natives and what's happening on the border is, um, is stark and startling. Uh, I keep remembering and thinking and sharing that in spite of Jackson's move west and in spite of the trail of and moving people further west into areas where they could not live their tribal life the way they had on their own land. There's still 500 tribes of native people here. Uh -huh. For Unitarian Universalists, I think looking at white supremacy, well, we have not delved into that. Um, my idea is that because slavery is over, at least that slavery, we can say a lot about current day slavery with the um, prison industrial complex, but Unitarian Universalists feel pretty good about slavery being over and um, the work they've done as liberals for um, the work they've done as liberals over the years um, to eliminate racism for black people. And I think there's, 
I think that white folks in general and you use particularly don't see a direct connection between them and slavery because slavery isn't happening today. But there is a direct connection between native people and white people and Unitarian Universalists because uh, native people continue to live on an occupied land. We're occupied by the United States government. We're not really part of it. Um, there's many tribes who have sovereign, sovereignty, sovereignty um, who in theory should be in relationship with the national government, but not part of it. Um, for Unitarian Universalists to think about and own it, own that they're living on occupied land. And, and it's very easy for, for Native people to be seen or not seen, to be in, invisible. Um, even in Unitarian Universalism, when when groups of people are talking about people of color and they go through the list of who, who the people of color are, over 50% of the time, they never say native people. And again, it's about invisibility, which is another way to annihilate people. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's enough unless somebody has any questions or comments. Kim, you were at the first lecture. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, because I, I imagine you saw both um, Danielle and there was another respondent, right? Welke, Wendy Salkin um, at the first lecture. So Kim, what are your thoughts? Um, well, nothing can beat what Danielle just said. Um, and I hate that I missed the second one because, you know, it's been a while since I've looked at Garvey, but Garvey had a contentious relationship with every Black leader, um, especially in New York. Um, so Garvey coming up is just really interesting because he's an interesting figure in and of himself. But um, popul American populism is a very interesting phenomenon. And I I, I think I, my question at the time was, could we have moved the time period back a little bit? Because once you put Jackson in place, the system was already set up. Jackson just exploited the system um, that was there already. And so um, how much of this is just, uh, how much of Jackson was a consequence of stuff that had been done the generation before with, with the founders and them trying to deal with building a nation, um, building a nation and, and being scared at the same time because they knew they were on occupied, they were occupying land and that they were using slaves to work that occupying that occupied land. So there's there are all these complexities to American populism that if you look at populisms overseas don't have the same issues because those populisms are homegrown because most European populisms, they're not really, they're, they're nuts. All populisms are nuts at some point, but um, they're a different kind of nuts than ours because we've always had a different mix of people. And um, there is something to a, a more homogenized group of people working things out as opposed to yeah, I'm getting ready to use the black use Black Panther terms, colonizers, and the colonized. When you're talking about populism, that's a very different dynamic than pop, if you study other populisms. I know Colin has, so um, if you study other populisms, it's a very different it's a it's a different entity, and it's 
so yeah, I just go back to how much of this, because we're talking about Jackson and how much Jackson influences today, because yeah, they love Jackson. Um, if we look back a generation and see all the seeds that Jackson, that brought up Jackson, it would be just like now if you looked at that the man who is currently occupying the White House, if you look back a generation to Goldwater, that you would see that that the consequence is that stuff happened 40, 50 years ago that didn't get resolved or got resolved and it didn't get resolved right. So um, I think that uh, Danielle's response to my first lecture, um, one of the things that she said at the very beginning was that basically, you know, the process did not start with Andrew Jackson. And I think that the process of annihilation, the process of genocide did not start with Andrew Jackson. And it's an incredibly important point. Um, I think that it uh, in some ways gets at what I might call like the myth of liberal innocence. It's not a term that's original to me, but um, which is that, uh, you know, somehow um, liberals, religious liberals uh, in the present moment might not be actively racist. So they have not like benefited or participated in systems of white supremacy that have been constructed, right? Um, and so one of the things like, one of the things why Jackson or why picking on picking Jackson, one of the things that's interesting about Jackson or that Jacksonian moment is his chief political rivals are all Unitarians. Um, John Quincy Adams is a Unitarian and John Calhoun, who is like one of the most virulent, awful white supremacists in American history is also a Unitarian. And they're, uh, I mean, the, the three of them have this very complicated relationship where uh, Calhoun is actually first John Quincy Adams, vice president, and then Andrew Jackson's vice president, and then has a falling out with uh, Andrew Jackson, partially um, over issues that have to do with uh, their different conceptions of genocide or Indian removal. Um, whereas Calhoun is positing uh, what we might call the assimilationist position. Um, and Jackson is really wanting to expel people. I mean, so that's part of the two of their falling, uh, falling out. Um, but I think that uh, one of the things that's sort of important in terms of thinking about the myth of liberal innocence in this is that I argue in the first lecture that progressives largely conceived, I, I'm calling John Quincy Adams a progressive because in my definition of a progressive, progressives seek social transformation through a process of state reform, which is what uh, Quincy Adams and others like, you know, gathered around him did, uh, were completely unable to stop the Jacksonian project of Indian removal in part because they did not um, ever look at their sort of own historic complicity in uh, benefiting from the genocides that had happened before or the attempted genocides that happened before in New England. Um, in fact, at the sort of towards at the end of the lecture, I say something like uh, Northern New England abolitionists were able to proclaim like no union with slaveholders, but Margaret Fuller, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and uh, John Quincy Adams never made a similar statement like no no union with Indian removers or Jacksonian populists uh, because they didn't ever pause to sort of discuss their own complicity or their own the systematic complicity in Indian removal. And in fact, their concern 
is primarily about um, how Indian removal will reflect upon sort of the white liberal community more than overall how it will impact uh, indi the indigenous nations, um, indigenous peoples. It's not that they don't have a concern for the indigenous nations, but if you were to read like Emerson's letter protesting uh, the removal of the Cherokee, it's like 75% this is terrible about what it does to kind of the white Republic and 25% of it's bad for the, the Cherokee. So. So, so Colin and others, I'm wondering, um, given Danielle has drawn the, the parallel very clearly with the current administration's uh, populist and racist genocidal policies, um, if we were gonna learn something from that ineffective response, uh, the ineffective response of, of progressives, you, who, who some many of whom were Unitarians of that day, uh, and do it better now. I'm hearing you say that we have to grapple with our own complicity in white supremacy. Am I hearing that right? I think that that's part of it. Yes. And and I would what? How would you charge us to do better? If well, you can I just ask one question about this? So one of the interesting tensions, I think. First of all, I love that Colin uh, in the second lecture, especially. Um, decentered whiteness and pulled up some of our history uh, because I actually believe when we're strongest is when we're not digging, we're not taking from something that feels like it's, you know, out of thin air that we're claiming as our own, but we're really digging into our own roots and, and claiming them and building on them. And we can choose which roots we pull on most deeply, right? So to give us a more of a sense of context of the landscape, the full landscape we stand on lets us choose, right? So I appreciated that deeply. Um, and it feels to me like, like there are two big questions in populism, and this is, I'm new to ex this exploration, so I'm grateful to Colin for kind of raising it, which is like, who are the people, right? And who do we exclude from the people? <laughs> um, and populism always also seems to have this tension between the people and, and the elites, right? And that gets exploited. So first of all, you want to talk about dismantling white supremacy, like let's get rid of the either or thinking, because actually, you know, the elites are not inherently evil, right? Our, our medical professionals are elites. <laughs> uh, so, you know, our people who know rarefied ways to fix important mechanics are elites, right? So, so there's danger and we've seen in Pol Pot, we've seen in other regimes, like when the elites get held up as something evil, like that's a danger and an evil in and of itself, right? So, so how do we also, and Unitarian Universalists have a lot of elites, so how do we step into this conversation of like, who are the people and help, help not let that be a divisive thing? And how do we also step in as people who claim their power, their, line, their allyship with people and their own elite status in some cases, and there's some elite status for I think almost everyone, right? Um, to move the conversation forward about the bigger question, which is like, how do we wanna be as a nation that actually brings everybody to the table um, to a place where if we were, to quote John Rawls, put in any position in society, we would be okay with that, right? Because right now, if you took me out of my position and you said, is this society just? Because, you know, would you be willing, in other words, to be put in any place in American society, just America? I would say no. So, right, clearly we've got a broken system. And I think populism has this power to get people behind visionary thinking about who we want to be and the mobilizing power to pull a lot of people behind making that real. I yeah, love I that. Mean, Who is the we? Go ahead, Colin. Well, I, I mean, I think that that in some levels is the like real question. So I'm not uh, totally opposed to populism. I mean, I think that like one of the reasons why I frame my work in the question of onto political ontology or being is I'm trying to say that like there are lots of different ways we can think about po doing politics and being politics and like uh they all have costs and benefits and do different things for us right and so um the problem with like populism and the opportunity of populism is that it constitutes it's focused around constituting a people and there's lots of different ways you could like imagine constituting a people it's just that like 
you could imagine constituting a people that's inherently multiracial, multilingual, uh, has different conceptions of um, sovereignty, like who rules society and how society decisions in society are making are are made. And there's like interesting contemporary evidences of like ways to constitute people that are not inherently like uh, negative. Like I can think of the Zapatista movement in Mexico, which constitutes their people amongst three, or sorry, five different uh, ethnic groups and says that this uh, indigenous community is going to um, have a, a sort of a new people that draws from these different uh, ethnic groups equally to, to organize together to have a new sense of who we are, right? Um, so I think that that question of like who constitutes the people is a crucial question for Unitarian Universalists to wrestle with and a crucial question for us to be sort of raising um, uh, raising as we're sort of trying to think about Unitarian Universalism and what our, our, our objectives are. Because um, I think that, well, I think maybe I've said enough right now, but that's... <laughs> So I was curious about Michael's question about what we would do differently. What I I'd I like to learn from history if I can. I mean, do you, does anything stand out like oh if only sure. you know? Well, I mean, I think yeah. The the if onlys are have to do with decentering whiteness. Um, so the 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 if onlys are to recognize first and foremost there is a huge difference between Unitarian Universalist institutions which are historically white and I think could be argued historically white supremacist if we understand white supremacist as any system of thought that privileges people who believe themselves to be white who are men. Um, and so uh, that is one thing, Unitarian Universalist institutions. And then there's Unitarian Universalist theology or like what we believe about the world. And that these two things are not the same thing um and that focusing on sort of understanding the difference between those two things as sort of like the unitarian universal association uh both challenges us to think about how we might do our his opportunities that we missed in our history um so um, the famous one being uh that i talk about is the harlem unitarian church which was uh church founded by Ethelred Brown, who was an Afro-Caribbean Unitarian minister and uh, was an incredibly dynamic, primarily, um, I mean, almost, I think almost exclusively black institution in Harlem that was a major political center um, for the Harlem Renaissance. And if we had had a, if we, if the leadership of the Unitar American Unitarian Association had a, had a different conception of what Unitarianism was. Unitarianism perhaps distinct as a theology on the one hand and the institution of the AUA on the other hand, they could have the leadership of the AUA um, nurtured this congregation and we would have a very different history around uh, African-American engagement with the institution of Unitarian Universalism in the 20th century. So, I mean, I think that that's, you know, that distinction between theology and institution is really important because it actually turns out if you like look across the world and say, who are people who have ideas that are similar to Unitarian Universalists? It's actually quite this multitudinous, fascinating intermix of uh, different communities, right? So the idea, if we think of sort of Unitarian Universalism at its core idea of uh, a universal idea of love and acceptance that there is sort of all people um, are loved by the divine, you can find similar ideas to that uh, in all sorts of dissident radical communities. Um, many of whom I suspect would make contemporary, most contemporary white Unitarian Universalists very uncomfortable to sort of see the echo between our theology 
and the theologies of these different groups. So I'm thinking again of the Zapatistas or the anarchists in Rojava right now, who in my reading of them have ideas very similar to ours. Um, but uh, I think that would make many Unitarian Universalists uncomfortable to think about those, those parallels. So. I think another stern letter would be written if anybody tries anarchy in any of our UU spaces. So um, Kimberly, I know you are <laughs> always a huge fan of Ethel Red Brown. So I'd love to hear some, some of your thoughts. I, I agree about that missed opportunity with Harlem. And I think UU's never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. So it's good to know that was always part of our history. Kim, what do you think? Um, it, it's interesting because, um, yeah, uh, Ethelred Brown is like my, my thing. Um, but uh, thinking about populism for, for one more second, America has had more multiracial populisms. They, they've existed for really, really brief periods of time. Um, cause I'm thinking about, I can't remember if Colin brought him up, um, Eugene Debs, when he yeah. ran for president, I mean, he ran for president three times, but um, he built, I mean, for America, a, an extremely multiracial, for that time period, coalition. Um, none of them lasted, I don't think any of them lasted more than like four years. Um, so essentially the time period of a presidential <laughs> um, cycle, but um, he did build something which was really unusual for the U.S. Um, so there have been real flickers of somebody trying to do something a, a little different when it comes to populism. Um, and yeah, Ethel Red Brown. Um, New York, <laughs> in the time period that Ethel Red Brown was there from the mid teens till he died in 1950 um, was an, a brew of really radical, especially if you're talking about marginalized people. Uh, New York was a really radical place to be. Um, so there's Ethel Red Brown, Marcus Garvey, as Colin talks about, was there. Um, Adam Clayton Powell, senior and junior, were both there. Um, and it, there's this really interesting thing going on. There was something about New York. There's always something about New York. Um, but when you look at the Ethel Red Brown story, the part of it that's really interesting is that even confronted with the threat, the only reason Ethelred Brown got his fellowship back was the threat of a lawsuit. That's it. It wasn't, oh, we figured out we were wrong. It was John Haynes Holmes, bless the man forever, being who he was and part of the ACLU that they threatened the AUA with a lawsuit. And if not for that, Ethel Red Brown would be truly consigned to the backwoods of history. And just, yeah, the Unitarians, Universalists, and Unitarian Universalists never find, always find extraordinarily creative ways of missing an opportunity. And that that one is just one of the more striking ones. Uh, is beyond reasoning. Uh, I'm very sorry to say we're coming to the top of the hour. That's a sad and very real note to end on, a very contemporary note to end on, I would say. Um, just the, all the missed opportunities. Colin, I know that the um, videos of the first couple men's lectures are online available. Is that correct? Is the text also available or is it video only? Uh, 
it's video only. The hope is that uh, the text is going to be published alongside the respondents' uh, responses as a book. Um, so I have been withholding Excellent. posting the text. Uh, okay. So hopefully, uh, yeah. So the the respondents who would be included in the volumes would be my lectures, and then um, Danielle uh, Wendy Salkin is a professor at um, Stanford uh, in philosophy and race and law. And uh, Anthony Penn, who's a professor at uh, Rice University, and then Susan Frederick Gray. So um, that is the, the hope. Uh, that is to be looked forward to very much. Thank you so much for coming. I see that a baby well, has come I to us on our way out. I'm sorry, Danielle. Uh, I, I want to call on to know that I'm working on my typed response because my <laughs> original response was not written. It was out of my head. <laughs> well, thank you for the blessings that come out of your head. Thanks for the blessings of the baby. <laughs> the view will be live at GA next week. We'll be uh, filming at 11 in Spokane, which, uh, which will be convenient for once for the West Coast people and mid afternoon for you East Coasters, it'll be at two. Uh, but we look forward to seeing you there. And if you're at GA, we'll be sending out on social media exactly where we're doing that. We're not quite sure yet. What's the baby's name? Oh, the baby's name is Nori. Nori. Well, what a nice blessing for Nori oh, to see us out hi. today. <laughs> May we hope and pray that we figure some of this stuff out by the time Nori's grown. <laughs> Thank you so much. And this is history always helps to inform the present. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.